Hi everyone, welcome back. Here we are starting chapter 24, which is quite a jump from our previous chapter 3, but this really does go very, very well with the cell biology chapter because what we're going to be looking at takes place within the cell, and that's going to be metabolism. Now, this is a pretty big chapter. There's a lot of material in this chapter, but we are only looking at a very, very small part of this chapter. We are looking at metabolism in general, and then we are looking at glucose or carbohydrate metabolism. So anything that is not either in our chapter 24 lectures or in the chapter 24 outline you can skip over that part of the chapter because you are not expected to know it for the class or for any of our quizzes or exams. So let's start, as always, with our not really attendance questions. First, in a redox reaction, what does it mean if something is reduced? Next, where does cellular respiration take place? And third, what is the molecule that the body uses to power endergonic reactions? So go ahead and try to answer those before moving on. And now let's see what the answer to these questions are. In a redox reaction, what does it mean if something is reduced? What is being reduced and how does it get reduced? Well, in a redox reaction, we have oxidation and we have reduction. The reduction part is when something is having its charge become lower. Its charge is being reduced. How do you lower the charge of something? You give it electrons. So gaining electrons is what reduced means. Something is gaining electrons, which reduces its overall charge. Next, where does cellular respiration take place? Cellular respiration takes place at the mitochondria. We learned that in bio, or I'm sorry, in chapter three, and we're going to be looking in this chapter at cellular respiration. Remember we said the powerhouse of the cell might be what most of us know is the job of the mitochondria. Well, we're going to look at cellular respiration and see how it got that little nickname. And last, what is the molecule that the body uses to power endergonic reactions? Well, first, what is an endergonic reaction? It's the opposite of an exergonic reaction. So what does that mean? Well, gonic refers to energy. So endergonic, we have to put energy into something before a reaction takes place. And exergonic reactions, energy is released. So here, endergonic reactions power, I'm sorry, I said that backwards, exergonic reactions power endergonic reactions. The exergonic reactions give off energy, and that energy is used to drive endergonic reactions. Exergonic reactions power endergonic reactions. And we're going to see how does that happen in today's uh, and next lecture. Now before we get into the actual lecture content, I will say there is a lot of chemistry in this chapter. There's no new chemistry. Like I said, I promise there's no new chemistry in any more of Bio-137 or Bio-139, but you do have to understand the chemistry that we learned in Chapter 2, and this chapter is going to rely heavily on that. So, if there's anything that you are hazy on from the chemistry chapter, it is a really good idea to go back and review that before moving on with these lectures. We are going to have a little bit of a review here just at the beginning over the terms that we will be using a lot, but it's much better to go back and do a full review of chapter two 
if you are one of the many that struggles with chemistry. So let's talk about metabolism, the point of this chapter. And again, this was introduced in chapter two, but let's go a little bit deeper now. Let's see how these words are gonna be used so that when we see it happening in our next lecture, it makes sense. Metabolism, we said, was the sum of all chemical reactions that happen in the body. And there are two different divisions within metabolism. There's anabolism or anabolic reactions and catabolism or catabolic reactions. Anabolism was taking smaller molecules and building bigger molecules from them. And catabolism is taking bigger molecules and breaking them down into smaller molecules. Think anabolic steroids. Bodybuilders will sometimes use anabolic steroids to build muscle. Anabolic builds. Catabolic reactions break things down. I always like to ask in my in-person classes, who has a cat? Well, if you have a cat or have ever had a cat, you know they are notorious for breaking things. Cat, catabolic, catabolism. Catabolic reactions break bigger things down into smaller things. Cellular respiration, most of what we're looking at in this chapter, is a catabolic reaction. It's going to break down carbohydrates, glucose, really all of the other things that we like to eat also. But we are looking specifically at glucose and other carbohydrates. Over here on the right, we see this kind of a very, very generalized image of how metabolism works. We eat something, we get big molecules like proteins and fats and things like that in our diet. Catabolism breaks them down into amino acids, nucleotides, simple starches, simple sugars, things like that. And then anabolism takes those things that are those smaller molecules and puts them together into other large molecules as we build things like the proteins that our body needs. So, now we're going to learn some new terms over the next couple of slides. They are based on concepts that we learned in chapter two, but we're going to learn some new terms. The first that we're going to hear a lot in this chapter is phosphorylation. Phosphorylation is the act of putting a phosphate group onto something. Doesn't matter what the something is. There is just a molecule that does not have a phosphate group. Something comes along and sticks a phosphate group to it. And that act is called phosphorylation. The thing that did not have a phosphate group and then got a phosphate group stuck to it, we say it has been phosphorylated. Phosphorylation is the act of sticking the phosphate group onto it. And there are two different ways that we can do that. First, we have kind of shown in this diagram over here. There's an enzyme there is a molecule that has a phosphate group stuck to it and another molecule that does not have a phosphate group stuck to it. It does, but it's hidden. So we're just going to say this guy here, the green sphere, has a phosphate group and he's going to put the phosphate group onto this ADP over here. This phosphate group starts on the green ball and is going to be moved onto the yellow ADP. The ADP is being phosphorylated. 
we are sticking a phosphate group onto it. That is called substrate level phosphorylation. We're getting into some bigger terms now. Substrate level phosphorylation. That is when a phosphate group starts by being stuck to one molecule, it is taken off and placed onto a different molecule. Substrate level phosphorylation. Phosphate group begins on one molecule and it is transferred to a different molecule. The other type is called oxidative phosphorylation. In oxidative phosphorylation, there is something we call inorganic phosphate. Our book likes to draw it as a P, like we see here, with a little bitty I next to it, a lowercase i. Oxidative phosphorylation takes inorganic phosphate and places it onto something. So what does that mean? Inorganic phosphate is a phosphate group that is not attached to anything. It's just free floating in the cytoplasm. Here, this phosphate is attached to something. Inorganic phosphate is just a phosphate by itself floating around in the cytoplasm. If something comes along and grabs that inorganic phosphate and sticks it onto something, that is called oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation, inorganic phosphate, free phosphate, is taken from the cytoplasm and placed onto a molecule. So both of those are phosphorylation. Substrate level phosphorylation, we are moving a phosphate group from one molecule onto another molecule. Oxidative phosphorylation, we are moving inorganic phosphate, loose phosphate, from the cytoplasm onto a molecule. We will be using both of those terms in our next lecture. Okay, next, some terms that we are familiar with, some new terms. Redox reactions, we just mentioned just a little bit ago. There's our old friend, the oil rig. Oxidation is losing electrons. Reduction is gaining electrons, oil rig. So in our next lecture, we are going to see some things that are oxidated, oxidized, oxidation reactions, and things that are being reduced, reduction reactions. A redox reaction is both of those together. And in a previous lecture, back in chapter two, we drew out a redox reaction. And incidentally, the redox reaction that we drew, if you wanna go back and watch it, was cellular respiration. C6H12O6, glucose, plus 6CO2, I'm sorry, 6O2, oxygen. So that is the reason we eat and the reason we breathe. That leads to 6CO2, the carbon dioxide waste that we breathe out. 6H2O, water that is produced as a byproduct. And energy. And energy is what we're after. We're going to see how that energy is made in our next lecture. Now these next guys, these are enzymes or coenzymes that we will be looking at a lot in our next lecture. So I'm going to introduce them today, explain what they do, so that in our next lecture when we see them we know what to expect. NAD plus and FAD. We're going to look at those two first, and then we're going to look at NADH plus H plus and FADH2. So first, NAD and F or NAD plus and FAD. You do not need to know 
what that stands for. That is not a chemical symbol, it's an abbreviation. NAD is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And the plus just means that it's got a positive charge. So nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, and you do not need to know the name, you just need to know NAD plus. And FAD, which is flavin adenine dinucleotide. So these two guys are kind of the same thing. They have a little bit of a molecular shape difference, but they kind of are the same thing. I like to say, think of them as pickup trucks. Their job is they are electron carriers. Anytime we see either of them, NAD plus or FAD, they're going to be doing the same thing every time. They're going to pull up to a molecule, take some things off of that molecule, and leave with whatever they picked up. So like a pickup truck. Pickup truck pulls up, loads something in the back, drives away. So what is it they're really doing at the molecular level? Anytime we see either of them, they're going to move to a large molecule, they're going to take electrons and leave with them. They're going to come up, take some electrons off of a molecule, and leave with them. Other things come along too. Really, it's protons come along also. But really what they're after are the electrons. So we call them electron carriers. They're like empty pickup trucks. They come up, they take some things and leave. Well, once they pick up those electrons and protons, but once they pick up those electrons, they change name. NAD plus is when it is empty, but once it picks up those electrons and protons, we call it NADH plus H plus. NADH plus H plus. NAD plus when it's empty, NADH plus H plus when it is full. NAD plus when it is oxidized, NADH plus H plus when it is reduced. FAD, same thing. When we see him, he is empty. He pulls up to a molecule, he takes some electrons and some protons, and he leaves. When he leaves carrying those electrons, we call him FADH2. FAD, when he is empty. FADH2, when he is full. FAD is the oxidized state. FADH2 is the reduced state. Listen to that a few times if you need to. I repeated them each multiple times on purpose because they really need to sink in because in our next lecture we will see that happening. The last new term on this slide, coenzyme A, abbreviated CoA. This is not an abbreviation. That is not cobalt and whatever A is. Coenzyme A is just abbreviated CoA. So coenzyme A is a molecular chaperone, a molecular chaperone. We will see him a few times in our next lecture. And every time we see them, he does the same thing. He comes along and he grabs a molecule. Some things are taken away from that molecule that would otherwise call that, cause that molecule to kind of fall apart, but coenzyme A holds that molecule together until the next step. We're gonna take some things off of a molecule, which would make that molecule want to fall apart. Coenzyme A holds on to that molecule so that that doesn't happen. He's kind of like the uh, sorority sister. Somebody's having a breakdown, they're falling apart, but Coenzyme A comes along and kind of 
holds things together until the trauma is over. Lastly, ATP. All right, now this is the real point of this whole chapter. ATP, we said, is the gasoline that the body runs on. ATP is the molecule that our body uses for energy. Where does that ATP come from? Cellular respiration. We're going to look at how ATP is built in our next lecture. But first, let's look at what ATP actually is. What is its structure? And we mentioned this back in chapter two. ATP is a nucleic acid based on the nucleotide adenosine or adenine. So let's look at what that structure is. It's built on the molecule of sugar called ribose, which is the sugar that's used in RNA, ribonucleic acid. Right in the middle, we have ribose. On one side, we have our nitrogenous base, in this case, adenine. This blue thing up here, this is adenine. When we have adenine stuck to a ribose, it's called adenosine. Adenosine is ribose plus adenine. Remember, on the other side of the nucleic acid is a phosphate group. If there is a phosphate group there, it is called adenosine monophosphate. That means adenosine with one phosphate stuck to it. Adenosine monophosphate, abbreviated AMP. If we stick another phosphate group onto that, that is called adenosine diphosphate. Two phosphate groups, adenosine diphosphate, ADP. And when we do that, these phosphate groups, it's kind of like pushing your finger down on a spring a little bit. You're pushing something down that doesn't want to be pushed down. You're sticking these two phosphate groups together that don't want to be stuck together. This bond right here has a lot of energy in it. If we break this bond, how would we break that bond? By taking this phosphate group off and giving it to someone else, by phosphorylating something. So if we break this bond, energy is released. But what if we have three phosphate groups stuck to this adenosine? We call that adenosine triphosphate, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, ATP. So we've talked about ATP quite a bit now. Here is what it looks like. A ribose, an adenine, and three phosphate groups. Well, this bond between these outer two phosphate groups has a whole lot of energy in it. It's like pushing your finger down hard on a big spring it's got even more energy than this bond. If you take this phosphate group off and give it to someone else, if we phosphorylate someone, a lot of energy is released here. Where does that energy go? To whoever we just gave this phosphate group to. So when you phosphorylate something, you are providing something with energy. When ATP gives this third phosphate away, when ATP phosphorylates someone, energy is released, quite a bit of it. Now, not only is that energy released to power whatever reaction we need, what happens to the ATP? Well, it becomes ADP. We could potentially give this second phosphate group away, releasing a little bit more energy. That's not as common, but it does happen. If we take that phosphate group and stick it back on, 
ADP becomes ATP. But we have to have energy to put that phosphate group back on here. So ADP and ATP are kind of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. We start with adenosine. We add a phosphate group, it becomes AMP. We add another phosphate group, it becomes ATP. We add another phosphate group, did I say that right? AMP, ADP, ATP. Remove one, remove one. We can just keep doing that. Take them off, put them back on. Energy is released, energy is put back in. All right, kind of a short lecture today, but that was because there are a lot of new terms I want you all to study before we go on to how cellular respiration works. Our next lecture is going to be one of the bigger ones of the semester. So plan to spend a lot of time with the next lecture, but do not watch it until everything that we just talked about in this lecture makes perfect sense. Ask those questions. Watch other videos if you need to, meet with a tutor, whatever it takes, get one of us to explain this in a way that you understand if you are not clear. All right, take care and I will talk to you in the next lecture.